office up here, this building, the office, it was a house that the family had started building and they got a divorce and they just boarded it up and left. And uh, this air property sat here for, I'm, I'm sure, for many years. It just absolutely just ran down, you know. And out here in the back, there was a couple of, as you, some of you remember or know, there was chicken houses. They were 200 feet long. One was 200, the other was 230. They had automatic feeders where they, the owners, they, they sold eggs. This is what this was, an egg farm. And uh, we tore those uh, chicken houses down, but there was a feed tower that was left at the end of one of them, and it was left standing. And one time, 25 years ago, um, I climbed up the wooden steps and took a look in there, and there was a young man sitting in there. He was 12 years of age, thereabout. And uh, I'd never forgotten that incident. And uh, tonight, that young guy's here. That's this guy right here. Dan, stand up so they can see you. That's this guy right here. <laughs> I'd never, I don't guess I've ever seen him since. If I, if I have, I didn't know it. I don't remember it. But uh, I do remember that uh, incident. And uh, he reminded me again tonight that I'm the guy, that he was the guy sitting up there. And I am just thrilled that he's here tonight. And you got your boy. Is this your son? Got your son here. What's your name? Okay, good to have you here tonight. It's good to have both of you here. And good to have you visiting with us tonight, too, this young lady here. It's good to have you here tonight. All right, if you have your Bible, turn to the book of Revelation. And I uh, just want to talk to you a little bit tonight. While you're turning there, let me uh, remind you, if you don't have your ticket to the banquet Saturday night, by all means, get a ticket. Uh, you ought to come, and if you can, if you're working, I understand that. And uh, I think you ought to quit your job and come. But no, don't quit your job because that's what the banquet's all about. Is so, that's a real dilemma. But anyway, by all means, come if you can. Uh, we're going to have a good time. Brother Hughes is going to come and preach. Uh, he is an outstanding pastor. I mean, he's a, he's he's one of the best preachers from, uh, when it comes to preaching the Word of God. I know, and he'll be here. He's our good friend. Uh, we've got some special music planned. Uh, we've got some things we want to show you. Some things that we're planning. One of our men, Brother Larry Moore, has worked countless hours on a display that he wants to show you. And he'll unveil that at the banquet. And, of course, we're going to have a delicious meal. Uh, be very nice. Uh, the cost is $10. And uh, that, we won't make a penny on that. That'll pay for, the, we're renting tables. We're renting the tablecloths. Uh, we're, paying the, we're paying the babysitters. We're, we're, we're catering in the food. We're paying for the food. And then we're going to pay the folks that help serve it. I guess we got, I think we got Brother uh, Stevens' church, some of his folks coming. That's the last I'd heard anyway. So anyway, uh, we're not, you know, that $10, uh, there won't be a penny that we'll make out of that. And that isn't the issue anyway. But I want you to come. And then as I said the other night, if you don't have the money, if you say, Preacher, I'd like to come, I want to come, I can't afford to come, I honestly don't have even have $10 then uh, I'll borrow the money from Brother Kelly. <laughs> but anyway, I'll get you come. I'll take care of it. I'll see that you get there, okay? But I want you to come. It'll be a good time of fellowship, and I'd like for you to just be able to, to be a part of it and see what we're trying to do in the future. And then we're going to have a kind of a victory report, talk about what, we've, what God has done in this past 12 months. And you'll be surprised. You'll be surprised what God has done. A lot of things you don't see. You know, if it's not happening just in your world, you think it isn't happening. But we want to show you all of what the ministries at Open Door Baptist Church, uh, what is happening and what is doing. You might not know it. You know, we have 22 students in our Bible Institute. You know, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. And uh, speaking of the Institute, I hope you'll plan to get signed up for that. Uh, we've put some additional sign-up sheets out. I understand we ran out. We put some more out there today. Kim did. And that the information is there. And uh, the first class will be uh, February the 2nd, Monday night, and uh, I hope you plan to be there. We'll be teaching, uh, continuing uh, our studies in the, is it Old Testament survey? Yes. Old Testament survey, Ron Lister's teaching that on Monday night. Mark Squire's going to be teaching the survey of Matthew on Monday night. Uh, Brother uh, Pastor Sidlowski will be teaching uh, soul winning on Wednesday night and uh, teacher training on uh, Thursday night at 6 o'clock and then I'll be teaching the book of Job at 7 and then rightly dividing at 8 o'clock so we're going to have a good time 
And then uh, if you'd like to take the book of Acts by correspondence, you can do that. If you'd like to do the book of Revelation or the book of Daniel, we have all of those available. And uh, I'm pleased to see that some of our young men are taking, the, taking those classes by uh, correspondence. So there's something there for everybody, and I hope you'll plan to, to be a part of it if, you know, if it'll fit your, fit your schedule. All right, if you'll turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 3, <clears throat> tonight uh, we're going to digress from our studies in Job. We'll do that for tonight, and I think in next Thursday night, and then the following Thursday night we should be back into our studies of Job. Tonight I want us to turn to Revelation chapter 2 and uh, look at verse, uh, or chapter 3, I'm sorry, and verse 14. Chapter 3 and verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of Laodicea write, These sayings saith the Amen, the faithful, and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to set with me in my throne, even as I am. Uh, I also overcame, and am set down with my Father in his throne. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. This Laodicean church is the last of the seven that are listed in the book of Revelation. Some have called this church the formal church. It had moved from soul winning and Bible teaching and praising the Lord and clapping of their hands and having a good time in church to formalism. Their preaching had moved more to tickling the ears of the audience than to pleasing God. The music was more formal and uh, people were more interested in accuracy than they were in content. And of course, uh, if an amen was heard, the guy was quickly ushered out by the ushers <laughs> and uh, like the one old boy, he got excited at church, and he was shouting and praising God. And uh, four deacons went and got him and grabbed him by, each by one arm and by one leg, and they started carrying him out. And he went out screaming and kicking. And he said, glory to God, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on one donkey. It's taken four to get me out. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> so, but it was, a, <laughs> it was a formal church, a formal church. Others have called it the cold church because the, the natural thing that follows this matter of a formalism is the fire goes out and people become cold and they become staid and stiff. And then others called it the dead church. Now regardless of what name you give this church at Laodicea, one thing that you can't miss is that it was a blind church. Whether it was dead or not, I don't know, but it was blind. Whether it was formal or not, I can't say, but I can tell you it was blind because that's the accusation the Lord makes against it, that it is blind, blind. And uh, let's look at some things that this church uh, had problems with, why it was blind. First of all, you'll notice that uh, Jesus is referred to by the angel as the Amen the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither hot nor or cold nor hot. Now creation and the Lord Jesus Christ has always been faithful for the purpose, to the purpose for which it was created. I mean rain was created to fall and we're blessed with that law in Seattle. 
uh, the son was ordained to come up every morning and to set in the west in the, in the evening. And it does that every day from the time it was created. It is faithful to its task. You understand? Creation is faithful. The animals were created to behave as they're supposed to. And no animal ever gets arrested, you know, for no monkey ever gets arrested for cheating on his wife. Um, you know, animals, you know, you don't find monkeys coming home drunk. Uh, you know, you don't have to have a police patrol for chimpanzees. It's just only people. Because people will not be loyal and faithful to that for which they were created. I mean, if there is a law that we can break, we will break it. And we do it by choice. But Jesus Christ was faithful to the task for which he was created. He is called the faithful and the true witness. He told the truth and he was faithful to the truth. But the church at Laodicea had departed from the truth. It was no longer, it was no longer a truthful church and it was no longer a faithful church. And so the angel of the church of Laodicea, he said, Write these things, saith the Amen the faithful and the true witness. And the word amen is referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's called amen. And I think we need to get back to doing more amens. Yeah. You won't bother me if you amen so much I can't preach. I, it, you know, I'd rather have some amens than old me's. And, uh, you know, I agree with one fellow. You know, if you, if you would say amen every once in a while, when a visitor comes in here, he'd get the idea, you know, I better listen. These folks, they think the preacher's right. You know, I mean, I'm just mad at the preacher and I don't like what he's preaching, but, you know, everybody else is agreeing with him, so that makes me a minority. Amen. But if a guy sits here and in his heart he's bitter and angry and mad and criticizing me and you are quiet, he doesn't know for sure whose side you're on, and I don't either. Amen. You understand? So amen is all right. It's a Bible word. Right. And so you ought to say amen. Uh, one colored preacher said amen is a, am a very important word. He said, uh, <clears throat> you notice when Jesus said amen, he don't amen once, he amen twice. <laughs> so amen is an important word. And Christ is the amen, amen. And he is the faithful and the true witness. Creation is faithful. Jesus Christ, would you turn to Hebrews 13? You want to keep your place in Revelation. But turn back to the book of Hebrews and uh, chapter 13. Talking about the faithful witness of Jesus Christ. I want to show you a verse that you ought to underline and, uh, and uh, not for some charismatic purpose, but for the purpose, the very purpose that we're talking about is you ought to be faithful because Jesus Christ was faithful. Amen. And by the way, you don't have to have a lot of brilliance to be faithful. You don't have to have a lot of talent to be faithful. You don't have to have skills to be faithful. You don't have to have money to be faithful. You don't have to have a title to be faithful. All you have to do is have some character to do what God wants you to do. That's what it means to be faithful. That's what Jesus was. Notice, if you will, in Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. He was, He is, and He is the one that shall come. He never changes. He's always the same. God's always the same. The world moves on toward the cesspool. Uh, you know, morals and, and, uh, and uh, cultures change, but God never changes as far as his consistency and his faithfulness and his standards. He's always the same. And Christ never changes. He's always the same. And if you'll read the context in Hebrews 13, verse 8, you'll, talk, you'll notice that. The Bible said we're not to be blown about by divers doctrines, you know, and these various winds that blow in every direction. You ought to just settle down and be faithful and stay consistent. Know what you believe and believe what you know and just stay consistent. You don't need to be on a mountain peak all the time. You can't be anyway, but you can be consistent. That's why you ought to just be faithful. You know what worries me, and, 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 and I'm, think, I'm just thinking about, and I've seen this cycle over and over and over, and I'm thinking, you know, Brother Jason came in here, you know, and brought his, brought his uh, girlfriend, Mary, and she got saved, and then they got married, and, and God bless them, and I hope they're here till Jesus comes, because I love them dearly. And then I think of the folks they've brought, and, and uh, they brought, uh, you know, you've influenced other young men to come, and others of you've done likewise, and you've come in, and you've gotten excited, and you used to sit over here. You know, we had the little group, and you'd shout and get excited and go. 
But you know, pretty soon, pretty soon you find out that Pastor Blue is just the same today as he was last month. And he'll be the same next month and the same next month. And you'll hear the same old stories. And when I start telling about my conversion, you can just shut your eyes and tell it. In fact, you can tell it better than I can. And you start hearing the same old jokes and you just laugh out of courtesy. And, uh, you know, it's just the same, it's the same old thing and the same old thing. And pretty soon that initial, that newness wears off and that, uh, that excitement wears off. And pretty soon you can't run on adrenaline anymore. You're going to have to build some character and you're going to have to put some, put some foundations in the ground and you're going to have to get a two before and strap it to your back so you've got some backbone. And you're going to have to stand and stand and stand and stand and stand because it's the right thing to do. Yeah. You see, you just can't. Pretty soon, the, the novel becomes the ordinary. That will be true in your marriage. That will be true in your work. That will be true in your church. Everything at the beginning is always more exciting. It's always more exciting to have a little baby in your home than it is <laughs> other folks. Now, I didn't say it. Now, listen. Don't, don't misunderstand me. I... Uh, I didn't say, I didn't say, and I don't imply, I didn't say we love a little baby more than we do the old folks or the teenagers or the young marrieds. I didn't say that because it isn't so. But I'll tell you what's more exciting to have a new baby in a home. I mean, there's more changes taking place when you have a new baby in the home. And you're up all hours of the night doing things you'd never done before. Right, Kelly? Amen. So it's always more excitement when you get a new baby. But it would be a crime to try to keep the little baby a little baby. We want them to grow up. We want them to learn to tie their own shoes. We want them to learn to feed themselves. We want them to learn to, to dress themselves. We want, we want them to know how to read and write and walk and talk and say yes, sir, and no, sir, and how to do things right, don't we? We want them to become a self-functioning citizen so that they're not dependent on society or mom and dad. I mean, isn't that the goal? Now, the same thing is true in a church. We expect people to come in at the entry level, to get saved. We expect them to act like new Christians, for they are new Christians. And we're excited and we love them and thank God for them. But when a guy has been saved three and four and five and six years, you would hope that he could learn to read the Bible by himself and pray a little bit now and then by himself and get out of bed by himself and go to church by himself. Wouldn't you think so? Amen. See? And so Jesus Christ was the same. He was consistent yesterday, today, and forever. Yesterday, today, and forever. You know, that's the kind of dad you need, and that's the kind of mom you need, and that's the kind of preacher you need, and that's the kind of employee you need to be. The same yesterday, today, and forever. Now that gets boring, but it lasts. That's not exciting, but it's enduring. You hear me? It's enduring. And endurance ultimately is what counts. I mean, you've heard the old story about the turtle and the hare. And the hare, I mean, he'd run ahead a few paces and turn around and flop his ears and make fun of, you know, at the turtle, tortoise. And the tortoise would finally get up with him. And the rabbit, he'd run off a few hundred yards and he'd wait. And pretty soon he got tired of that. He says, man, this is so boring I can take a nap. And he did. <laughs> and you know the rest of the story? The tortoise never got to rest till he got across the finish line and he won. And I would rather, I'm telling you the truth, I would rather have somebody. i tell you what, you know what will excite me? is if the Lord tarries that in 15 years from now you're still sitting out there looking at me and I'm up here looking at you. That's what counts. I'm not, I'm not too excited about five years or 10 years. I heard Paul Vanneman. Paul Vanneman, he, he drowned, as you know, and was on a mission trip and, and uh, he and some others and they got in the ocean and he drowned. And uh, he's a, he was one of the finest men I knew, one of the finest pastors I knew. And he'd preached here several occasions downstairs. And I, I'm not sure if he'd ever preached up here or not. I can't remember. But I'd been here 15 years one time when Dr. Vanneman came. In fact, Dr. Vanneman was one of my professors. And 27 years ago when I came here to pastor, and he heard that I had cancer, 
He sent me a check of almost $400. And that was big money 27 years ago. And he said to me, he said, now this is for you personally. And if you give it to your church, I'll get you for the embezzlement of funds. He, he's just that kind of guy. He helped preachers. He helped people. Anyway, he said to me, he said, Brother Ken, I'm glad you've been here 15 years, but I'll be impressed when you're here another 15. Hear what he said? It is one thing to start. It's another thing to finish. Jesus Christ was the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's boring. That's monotonous. But that's life. And that's what you ought to do. Quit trying to look for a new thrill every six months. Amen. Just get, get in the harness, buckle up, and get with it. You say, well, my class is boring, then liven it up. I've heard that story before. Well, hear it again. It won't hurt you. It won't hurt you. See? Jesus Christ was the faithful witness. Creation is faithful. Creation responds to God. The wind and the waves obey him. He said to the wind, hush. And it stopped blowing. He said to the waves, be still. And someone said they laid down like little lambs at their mother's breast. And they said, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? The wind and the sea obey him. One time Jesus said to Simon Peter, he says, uh, you need to go pay the taxes. Peter said, I don't have any money. Jesus said, go fishing, which is a lesson for every soul winner. Yeah. Go fishing. And so Simon Peter went fishing. He's out there casting in. Nothing's happening. Pretty soon the Lord looked down and said, well, we've let him wait long enough. And God said to a fish, he said, uh, <clears throat> see that shiny gold coin laying down there on the bottom of the Galilee, sea, sea of Galilee? Fish said, who's talking? God said, I'm talking. Oh, he said, I'm not used to listening to you talk. What are you saying? He said, I want you to pick up that gold. This is in the Greek, kids. He said, I want you to pick up this coin. So he went down and he picked up the coin. He said, now, go get on that hook. Go get on the hook? That's total commitment. But he went and got on the hook because God told him to. And Peter pulled him out, took the coin out of his mouth, unhooked him, threw him back in the water. He was a modern-day fisherman. Threw him back. He took the coin and went and paid the taxes. I say the wind obeys him. The sea obeys him. The creatures obey him. There was a donkey in which man had never ridden. They put Jesus on it. No problem. This church was not fulfilling the purpose for which it was created. The church was not created to be complacent. The church was created to be a place of evangelism and world missions and edifying the body of Christ. Anything else besides that is supportive or baggage. This church, its purpose was to give witness to Jesus. Its profession was that it belonged to Christ. It said, they said this. And then its pulse testified that it did nothing for Christ. It was lukewarm. This was a sick church. Notice the second thing about this church is it was complacent because it didn't need anything. Notice in verse 17 of back in our text in Revelation 3. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing. You know, that's a dangerous state for anybody to be in. It is dangerous. I mean, with the advent of the computer, many of God's people are closing their Bible. And you know, God gave you a book, not a computer. And you ought to read a book. Faith comes by hearing, and you ought to open the Word of God, and you ought to read it. I don't, I'm not, you know, I mean, computers are all right, but they may not be as good for us as we think they are. In fact, I think most of the time they're just paper mills and time wasters. So we have to be careful with them. But I know one thing is we need to get into the Word of God and read the Bible. But we have need of nothing. You know, uh, Ezekiel chapter, will you turn the Old Testament to the book of Ezekiel? 
Ezekiel chapter 16, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. And I'm going to wait for you because I want you to read it. Isaiah, uh, Ezekiel chapter 16. And verse 49, Ezekiel 16, verse 49. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom, pride, fullness of bread, abundance of idleness was in her and her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor or the needy. This was the indictment that God brought upon Israel and likened them to Sodom and Gomorrah. And he said, This was the sin of thy sister Sodom. Pride, one, we've arrived. Two, fullness of bread, we have need of nothing. And idleness, spiritual inactivity. Nothing to do, but just waste the hours. And that was the problem with this church at Laodicea. They had become complacent. They said, we have need of nothing. Lot made a mistake based on that kind of uh, theology back in Genesis chapter 13 and verse 9. Let's go back to Genesis. Let me show you this. In Genesis chapter 13, you know the story. A Lot was a nephew of Abraham. They came into the promised land together. And if you look at verse 5, it says, And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents, and the land was not able to bear them, they had need of nothing, that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so that they could not dwell together. And there was a strife between the herdsmen of Abram's cattle and the herdsmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Perzerite dwelled, in, dwelled then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between thy herdsmen and thy herdsmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take to the left hand, then I will go to the right. And if you depart to the right hand, I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of of the Lord like the land of Egypt as you come into Zorah. And then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and he journeyed east and separated him, themselves the one from the other. And you know the rest of the story. Lot moved into a wicked city that was full of sodomites, and he lost all of his family in that city. And the reason is because he had uh, come to the place to where he had need of nothing, they had so many herds and so many cattle, so many servants, that uh, the only battle that was going on was between themselves. And you might say to me, Pastor, I don't, I don't, ha I don't need anything. Then you ought to give something away. If you don't need something, give something away. Maybe you ought to give enough away to where you do need something. Let me ask you this. Do you need to pray more? Uh, do you need to witness more? Do you need to give more to your church and missions? Do you need to teach a Sunday school class or work in a min ministry? Can't you think of anything you need? Or have you arrived? See, the church at Laodicea had come to the place to where I think in their mind they really believed they didn't need anything. We need nothing. In verse 17, it describes them. It says that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. That's quite an indictment, isn't it? God's command in verse 18 is to repent. Look at verse 18. I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that thy shame of thy naked do, do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. The first thing you notice in this text is that God calls us to a life of holy commitment to God. You'll notice he says, I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire. Gold tried in the fire. 
Now, God's people, as far as their works is concerned, is likened here to gold. In fact, I'll show you in a minute where your works are compared to gold, silver, and precious stones. And the gold here is a righteousness that brings glory to God. And he said that I counsel you as a church to produce a righteousness that is purified like gold that has gone to the fire. <coughs> and you'll know a Christian, by the way, the more fire a Christian goes, to, goes through, the better Christian he or she is. You do know that, don't you? The more fire that a child of God goes through, the more refined he is spiritually. And when we have no chastening and no fire, no adversities, no problems, then we pick up too much dross and we become fool's goal. We fool ourselves. An example of what I'm talking about is in Romans chapter 12. If you want to turn there, Romans chapter 12, he says uh, in our text, he said, I counsel you to buy me gold tried in fire. And in chapter 12 of the book of Romans, Paul says the same thing basically to these Roman Christians. He said, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, Romans 12, 1, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, what God is saying here is, one, as you present your body. It's amazing how many of us try to buy off with money and other things so that we don't have to personally get involved in the lives of people. You understand? We want to minister from afar. You know, I was telling somebody the other day, you know, the thing that I believe that has made Brother Backstrom successful in the youth ministry is he's in the middle of it. He can't run it from an office. He up maybe till midnight or one or two in the morning walk, talking with teenagers and counseling with teenagers and spending time with them. And you know what we want to do is many times is we want a Sunday school class or a bus route or a ministry that doesn't cause us to get involved in the lives of people. You want me to write a check, I'll write a check. You want me to write a letter, I'll write a letter. You want me to make a phone call, I'll make a phone call. But don't expect me to, to get involved and have people into my home or me to be in their home or take them out to lunch or spend time with them because that gets too entangled. Well, God is saying in chapter 12 and verse 1, He says, I want you to present your bodies a living sacrifice. You know what you do with a sacrifice? You put it on an altar and it burns. That's what a sacrifice does. But God says, I don't want you to die as far as your physical life is concerned. He says, I want you to die to yourself so that you can live for others and live for God. That's what he's talking about. It's a sacrifice. You say it takes too much time to come down here and do this and go bus call it. Well, sure it does. That's what a sacrifice is. And by the way, the only real life that you can sacrifice is your time because that's what life is. You know, I know of churches right here in the city of Linwood and every city in America. In the summertime, they shut down their Sunday night and their midweek services. Well, if I got my paycheck from some national headquarters, I probably would too. Because it makes no difference what the attendance is or if anybody comes or not. I don't mean that I would do it, but if I was that carnal and backslidden, I would. But I don't have a Thursday night and a midweek service and a Bible institute and, and preach four times a Sunday because I need something. I do it because I believe God's people need something. I don't need to preach four times on Sunday and twice on Thursday night. I don't need to do that. But there's some folks that need it. So, I beseech you, brethren, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy. God is holy. 
He said, I am holy, be ye holy. Did you know the name of the Holy Spirit is holy? It's holy. Holy. Not with a W, with an H. Holy. Pure. God is light. And in Him is no darkness at all. If you held God up to the light, He'd be transparent. You wouldn't see any blemishes. You wouldn't see any stained glass. You'd see right through Him. He's transparent. You know what you like about little, little bitty kids? Little bitty ones. They're transparent. Aren't they? But as we get older, we start to get stained and cluttered and blemishes. Then we put up the stained glass. We call it fronts. We call it walls. We have different names for them, but they're so people or things can't get close to us. See? Notice again, holy, acceptable unto God. Acceptable. Not everything is acceptable to God. Just because something's acceptable to you and to me doesn't mean it's acceptable to God. The book of Malachi is very clear about that. Israel had so backslidden and digressed from the holiness of God that when it came time to offer a sacrifice, they carefully went out into the barnyard and they looked for an old cow that had pink eye or scurvy or a broken leg. And they chose that animal because they knew it wouldn't bring any money down at the auction block. And they took that animal to the temple and they all had the priest to kill it and offer it to God on a sacrifice. And you know what God said to Israel? He says, give that to your mayor. See if he'll take it. Give it to your governor. See if he'll take it. And yet you expect me to take less than you would even give to your own local officials. I, uh, I think it's a crime. And I think good service and good waitresses, I think they're all underpaid. I think all waitresses are probably underpaid. And I think tipping is in order, if that's your business. But the day hasn't come when I'm going to give a waitress more than I'm going to give God. <laughs> but don't, don't, I'm not trying, now you can say, well, amen, you know, I'm a skin flint. I don't give God anything and I'm not going to give a waitress anything, you know. <laughs> you know, that's not the kind of amens we're looking for. I do believe in tipping, but I don't believe in tipping God. God wants a sacrifice. Sacrifice. Whether it be your time, or your body, or your talent, or your money, or your family, whatever, or your goals, or your ambitions, you ought to sacrifice them to God. Notice again in our text, notice again in our text, God not only calls for a holy life of commitment, He calls for a holy covering a garment that covers one's nakedness. Back in Revelation chapter 3, notice what he says, that he says that and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed and thy shame of thy nakedness do not appear. Now book, the book of Revelation in chapter 19, if you want to know what that garment is, turn to Revelation 19 and look at verse 8. Revelation 19, 8. It says, and to her, that's the bride of Christ, was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. Now watch what the fine linen is, ladies and gentlemen. For the fine linen is the righteousness, righteousnesses of the saints. This righteousness here is not the imputed righteousness of Christ. This righteousness is the righteous acts of God's people, such as Noah was righteous and, and uh, Job was righteous and Abraham was righteous. You are righteous in that you have imputed righteousness, but you ought to be righteous in your behavior. Otherwise, you are naked before God. And this church at Laodicea was a church that, was, that uh, had abandoned its holy walk and holy commitment. And then last of all, he prays, he calls them to a holy vision. Look at what it says in our text again in verse 18. Anoint thine eyes with eye salve, 
that you may be able to see. You see, this only comes, you say, Preacher, what is that eye salve? What is the eye salve I could anoint my eyes with so I could see? You know what it is? I'll show you the eye salve. It's right here. If you turn the TV off and look at this, you'd get some eye salve. This is eye salve. This is it. It's the Word of God. And he says you need to anoint your eyes with eye salve that you can see. Because any other vision that's out apart from this book is a false vision. The only thing worse than a blind lost man is a blind Christian. And then last of all, look at verse 19 in our text in Revelation 3. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come unto him and will sup with him and he with me. God is eager to restore this backslidden, cold church to its former relationship. God is very patient. He is long-suffering. His mercies endure to every generation. I'm glad that God's not like me. I mean, I'd have nuked myself a long time ago. But God is patient, isn't he? Aren't you glad he's patient? Amen. Do you think you would put up with somebody treating you the way you have treated God? You'd divorce your wife if she ignored you as much as you ignore God. You would. And yet God's patient. He just keeps waiting. He said, all day long have I stretched out my hands like a parent to a disobedient child. All day long. Can you? I've seen mothers and dads do that to, to rebellious children. But I can't imagine going by the street at 8 o'clock in the morning and see a little kid throwing a fit on the sidewalk and the dad standing there with his hands. Come back by at noon and the dad's still standing there with the little boy and he's throwing a fit. Come back by at 5 o'clock in the afternoon and the dad's still standing there. I would have probably had a two before and helped him. <laughs> but I'm not God. God is patient. He hath not dealt with us after our iniquities. And so he's eager. He says, as many as I love, I rebuke. You hear me? As many as I love, I rebuke. You know why God's not afraid to rebuke you? Because he's not running a popularity program. He wants what's best for you. He wants what's best for you. We don't tell people the truth because we're afraid they might not like us. God says, I'm going to tell you the truth. Maybe you'll listen and it'll be the best thing for you. Later on, you'll like me. Later on, you can tell me how much you like me. But right now, he says, I'm going to rebuke you so you'll do right. Did you know the book of Proverbs says that life is made up of rebukes? You know why you ought to be zealous and repent? Because he loves you. That's why. Nobody ever loved you like God does. Amen. Nobody can. There's nobody can love you like God. Nobody. You say, how much does God love me? Well, stand still for a while and look at the cross. If you'll just contemplate the cross for about 30 minutes, you'll be thanking God for how much he loves you. That's how much. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Not only does he love you, he seeks you. Notice he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I stand at the door and knock. How long has he been doing that? Maybe all your life. There's a song I've been trying to get one of our young ladies to sing. He was there all the time. You say, when's he going to stop knocking? You better hope he doesn't. You say, well, but he's driving me crazy. Yeah. Why don't you open the door? I stand at the door and knock. 
If any man hear my voice, I'll open the door. You know why he's knocking like that? Because he loves you. Amen. Folks are in bed asleep. They hear voices. They're afraid. They won't get out of bed. They're terrified. Somebody's banging on their door. They won't get up. They're afraid to go. You know what it is? It's a neighbor trying to tell them their house is on fire. But they won't answer the door. Amen. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in. And then you know why he wants to do it, Christian? Because he wants to sup with you. A house is a mortuary. It's a tomb. If nobody you love lives in it. Nothing worse than an empty house without someone into love being in it. You hear me? Jesus Christ wants to fellowship with you. That's what Christianity is anyway. It's a fellowship. It's a fellowship. This is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God. Well, the next move is yours. How is your spiritual heat? Oh, you say, I'm not really, really on fire for God. Oh, you really backslid. Oh, no, no, I'm not that bad either. I see. Somewhere in between? Yeah, come on. Maybe lukewarm? I'm not really hot for God. Oh, you're not, huh? But I'm not as bad as some folks. I guess maybe just kind of lukewarm in the middle? That's just the crowd he's talking to. You know why he's talking to that crowd? Because he said, if you were hot, I wouldn't have to rebuke you. If you were cold, you'd be uncomfortable and know it. But you're lukewarm. And that's not where I want you to be. I want you to be hot or cold. I don't want you to be lukewarm. I want you to get on fire or get all the way back so you'll realize how miserable you are so I can get you back to where you belong. What will you do about it? What will you do about it? Do you have a need? He's at the door. Let's bow in prayer. Our Father, this evening, I pray that if there's someone here tonight that is not saved, I pray they'll get saved. You are not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And then I pray for Christians who are just toying around They've kind of let the fire go out. And they need to stir up the gift of God that's within them and do the first work. They need to anoint their eyes so they can see. I pray if there's someone here like that tonight that a real, honest decision will be made in their life. And they'll get on fire for you and be what they ought to be for you. While our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, I wonder how many tonight can say, Pastor Blue, I know I'm not all I ought to be, but thank God I'm saved. If I died, I know for sure I'd go to heaven. Would you slip your hand up if you know that to be true in your life? Thank you. You can put your hand down. Just keep your head bowed for just a moment. I certainly don't want to embarrass anybody, but I'd rather embarrass you than to have you to be lost. I wonder if there's anybody here say, Pastor, I don't know if I'm saved or not, but I'd sure like to know it. Would you slip your hand up so I can pray for you quickly? You say, I don't know if I'm saved or not, but I'd like to know it. Is there one? Quickly. Anywhere. I wonder if there's some lukewarm Christians here tonight. Is there one that say, Pastor, pray for me. I need to, need to get on fire for God. Quickly. There's one. There's another. There's another. There's another. There's another. Amen. Well, I, it's good that you can see it. That's good that you can see it. The lady you'll see it in church couldn't see it. They couldn't see it. We have need of nothing. We're going to sing in just a minute. We're going to pray first, and then we're going to stand and sing. And if you need to come and pray and just do business with God, you do it. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'll bless this invitation. May it bring glory to you. May some real work be done in our hearts this evening. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
What are we singing? <clears throat> Number 282. Let's stand together. If you need somebody to talk to you about the Lord, you come. Come on. Amen. Come on. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come, just as Just as I am the dust about With many a conflict, many a doubt Fightings and fears within Without a Lamb of God I come, I come Just before we sing this very last stanza None of us are at the heat God wants us to be and we ought to be. We, are not, we have not arrived. Because we have a ministry doesn't mean we're spiritual. Doesn't mean it. Your ministry can be successful, but you be a failure. Because thou art lukewarm. 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 You come. This will be the last stanza. Come on. Just as I am full, wretched, blind, sight, riches, healing of the mind, yea, all I need in thee to all of you to get involved in the soul winning ministry of the church just roll up your sleeves get in your bible start praying telling people about Jesus Christ but the most important thing is to keep your relationship with the Lord the way it ought to be uh, brother Kelly come and dismiss us in prayer would you please let's pray our gracious heavenly father Lord we thank you for challenging our hearts tonight Lord, I pray that I wouldn't leave this place and be the same as I was before. God, I pray that this wouldn't just be for a day or two, but Lord, it would be a life-changing thing in our lives. And that God would be a difference in this world because of our burden to, to please you, God. Not to be just middle-of-the-road, lukewarm Christian, God. I pray we'd be hot. I pray it'd be obvious through this church that it's a hot church. People are sold out for you. I pray that each ministry and each life would represent um, Christians who are hot for you, Lord. And Lord, that it would make a difference in this community. People would see the difference where there's a church where people are surrendered completely to your will. God, I pray you'd take us now as we leave and bring us back Sunday with many as we can. Lord, help us to bring them in that they may be saved. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Be sure to shake hands with folks. Good night. God bless you.
That's his wife. Very pleasant young lady. That's their little daughter. I don't know if I can clear that up. Maybe I can. And then uh, the lady there in the middle, that's uh, Joseph's daughter and her husband in the back, and then his wife, Joseph's wife in the front. And then I believe that's their, his daughter in the back to the left. And then that little girl in the front was one of the orphans they raised. And she is the most pleasant young girl I've ever seen. See that smile? That smile was on there all the time. She smiled. Matter of fact, she just, she's the most pleasant and uh, wholesome young lady you've ever seen. And uh, just uh, love the Lord. And, uh, but that, uh, these are the people there at Joseph's house. And uh, they're easy to love. And when you think about India, would you think about these young ladies and the young men? Uh, they need to know Christ as their Savior. They're beautiful young people, but they really don't have any hope. They don't have a CD player or a television or a car. They don't worry about what movie they're going to go see. They worry about what their next meal is going to be. And... Uh, when you think about India and you think about Joseph, would you pray? And some of you young people, maybe God will touch your heart. I don't know what those little girls are thinking. Maybe that one, that tall one is saying, somebody come over and tell me about Jesus. Maybe. Is she going to marry some guy that will abuse her and mistreat her? Who knows? But I hope you'll remember them and pray for them. I hope you'll pray for Brother Joseph. And I'm telling you all around this world, there's literally millions and millions like this. Their faces, but their eternal souls. And God uh, wants you and me to get the gospel to them. There are millions like this in China and millions in India, millions in South America. And yet, here in America, you know, we're, we're thinking about how can I get my college education so I can make more money. And you ought to be surrendering your life and making your life count for God and getting people saved. A lot of people to make money. But some of you young people, you ought to just, you ought to chart your course and say, I'm going to be a missionary and I'm going to take the gospel where it's never been taken. And I'm going to do what I can to see that people hear the gospel. Okay? All right. Okay. I'll leave that run for just a little bit. The writer in Jeremiah said, I looked on my right hand and on my left, and refuge failed me. No man cared for my soul. Paul had a vision of a man in Macedonia, said, come on over and help us. Come on over and help us. And uh, the Bible is very clear that we need to get the gospel to the world. We need to get the gospel out. And uh, I'm certainly not the Holy Spirit. And I would not even attempt to tell you what God wants you to do. But I think it's a crying shame to start another church on a street where there's a Bible preaching church when there's countries that don't have the gospel. And I was in Venezuela with Brother Reese down in the jungles. And the Rodmans have worked with one tribe for 18 years just trying to get the Bible translated in their language. Not one saved person in the village. Not one. And you'll find villages all over this world where there's not one saved person. No one's ever heard the gospel. And uh, if you'd like a challenge, if you'd like something that would challenge your soul and something that God could really use you, you ought to be praying. Now, I know some of you... Well, I don't know it either. I, some, you know, I see what's happening now is a lot of men, a lot of men and women as they get older, some po folks when they retire, uh, they're saying, hey, I'm going to the mission field and using my life for the Lord. And I discovered with my trip to Venezuela that you don't have to, you don't have to be a pastor to go to the mission field. You know, you could be a mechanic, you could be a teacher, you could be a cook, uh, uh, you could be a pilot, uh, you know, just anything. Because God can use you. God can use you. And uh, so I hope tonight that uh, that will help you a little bit. Uh, again, I'm sorry I didn't get my own pictures uh, developed and Brother Mitch's didn't get developed. But I think that will help you to see the burden. I hope it will. I hope it will help you to see the need. 
Now, maybe you're here tonight and you're not saved. You don't know Christ as your Savior. I want to give you an opportunity to get saved. Um, Jesus told us to go.